Lauren Berlant and Michael Warner's transformational article, uh, Sex in Public. Now this was written in 1998, and you'll see here um, in the image uh, to the right of your PowerPoint screen, this is the first Gay Liberation Day protest in 1970 on Christopher Street. So this was um, a year after Stonewall, um, which, um, if you know anything about that, was uh, when uh, queer people uh, fought back against uh, the police raiding their spaces uh, in New York City. Um, so there was a, a long history of policing and, um, and violence enacted against queer bodies, raids of, of gay bars, and um, Stonewall was, uh, was a really important moment in queer history because that's when um, LGBTQ people fought back. And this is a representation here, this, this uh, picture of the first uh, Gay Liberation Day, which now we know as, uh, as Pride, right? Um, so Berlant and Warner are coming out of this um, more radical tradition. Um, they espouse many of the tenets that we saw in our graphic history. Um, they are what you would think of, what we would think of as radical queer theorists. And the reason why I taught this article is because they introduced the concept um, heteronormativity here, um, which, is, which has been fundamental uh, for queer studies. Um, their thesis is that <clears throat> radical aspirations of queer cult culture building, uh, uh, not just a safe zone for queer sex, but the changed possibilities of identity, intelligibility, public's culture, and sex that appear when the heterosexual couple is no longer the reference or the privileged example of sexual culture. So Berlant and Warner are really interested in decentering the heterosexual couple um, and leveling the playing field, right? And their aspirations are radical. Now, 1998, this was long before we had gay marriage. Um, gay marriage was something that Berlant and Warner would not have wanted. They did not want that. They would have seen that as being uh, uh, something that is akin to selling out and becoming um, absorbed by the mainstream. They wanted to keep a kind of separate um, culture and politics for queer people. Um, and, and their way in is by critiquing heterosexuality and also by saying that queer world making, it was a very utopian uh, project that they had, um, is something that means undoing heteronormativity. Now, what is heteronormativity? Berlant and Warner argue that heteronormativity is the institutions, structures of understanding, and practical orientations that make heterosexuality seem not only coherent, that is, organized as a sexuality, but also privileged. So heteronorm to say something is heteronormative is to also think about the way that these structures are implemented institutionally in our national psyche, in the structures of understanding, in, you know, at Marquette University. We talked about how Marquette can be heteronormative, right? Um, and, and they go on to argue that heteronormativity is more than ideology or prejudice or phobia, so it's more than just homophobia against gays and lesbians. It is produced in nationality, the state and the law, commerce, medicine and education, narrative, romance. Heteronormativity is all around us and it's hard to identify it when it's so diffuse. Um, so we've also got some page citations for you there to go back and, and look at this. I know that this is a challenging article, but I would like for us to work through it together. They also talk about the whiteness of what they call national heterosexuality. Now, what they def define as national heterosexuality is the mechanism by which a core national culture can be imagined as a sanitized space of sentimental feeling and immaculate behavior, a space of what they call pure citizenship. So heteronormativity is, in its very definition, white. Okay, uh, it, uh, it, is, it is something that is upheld by um, structures of white supremacy. And it assumes whiteness 
as default, right? So we might ask ourselves this question, how does white supremacy harness national heterosexuality in order to embolden itself or in order to make itself coherent? So this may be a question to, to come back to. They also talk about um, queer counterpublics. Um, now, by queer culture, right, they say here, they mean a world-making project, right? Where world, like public, differs from community or group because it necessarily includes more people than can be identified. More spaces than can be mapped beyond a few reference points. Modes of feeling that can be learned rather than experienced as a birthright. The queer world is a space of entrances, exits, unsystematized lines of acquaintance, projected horizons, typifying examples, alternate routes, blockages, incommensurate geographies. World making, as much in the mode of dirty talk as of print mediated representation, is dispersed through incommensurate registers, by definition unrealizable as community or identity. Now, as you can probably ascertain from this quote, right, their project is very much a utopian one. They're imagining a better world for queers. And um, they're also writing against a, a backdrop in which um, the, the reason why this article is titled Sex in Public is because um, uh, as they talk about in their article, there are several public um, spaces for queer people in places like New York City and San Francisco in the 90s that are being closed. So adult bookstores, you know, cruising zones where um, uh, same-sex couples meet, these are being policed in new ways and sexuality is becoming privatized. That is, you know, only happening within um, uh, certain spaces that's being contained. Um, and so they're writing against that grain and they're trying to imagine a world in which um, queer people have access uh, all queer people, regardless of their socioeconomic status or race, have access uh, to, to a larger um, uh, community. Now, what are queer counterpublics? To go, to go along with that previous slide, making a queer world, they say, has required the development of kinds of intimacy that bear no necessary relation to domestic space, to kinship, to the couple form, to property, or the nation. These intimacies do bear a necessary relation to counterpublic, an indefinitely accessible world conscious of its subordinate relations. So a queer counterpublic is by definition um, that which is not um, tied to property, right, or to national heterosexuality. But the key is these spaces, to, to be a queer counterpublic, has to be accessible to everyone. And I think when I think of accessibility, I'll also think of disability, right? Is this space accessible to queer disabled people? Um, so that is uh, what I wanted to say. There's obviously a lot more going on in this, in this article. So what I'm hoping that we can do today is work collectively to try to understand some of Berlant and Warner's um, major arguments, obviously heteronormativity and national heterosexuality and queer counterpublics are all part of that argument. Um, and so what I'm gonna ask us to do is to go onto Google Drive and do a collaborative annotation of the article. Um, their instructions will be in D2L, but what I'm hoping that you'll do is, is annotate, that is um, add at least a couple of questions or comments to specific passages and then also respond to a couple of your classmates, okay? Um, so that's it 